started. Welcome, everyone. This is the August edition uh, of, or excuse me, the September edition uh, of Tennessee Turf Tuesdays for 2021. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Browson, and I'm really excited to uh, be part of today's session. I've got some friends with me from the pathology world uh, from not only Tennessee, but universities across our region. And we're going to have a, a really awesome discussion, I think, about everything that's been going on this summer in the world of turfgrass pathology. I know as a, a pathology enthusiast, I'm going to learn a lot and I'm sure that you will too. Before we uh, get into the, the nuts and bolts, uh, a few things about pesticide credits. Uh, when you registered for today's session, uh, Zoom asked you all of the relevant details we need for uh, submitting pesticide rosters to the different state agencies. So all of that information should have been captured at registration, and we will use that information that you provided to create a roster for Tennessee and South Carolina and Kentucky and Georgia and all the other um, states that we have pesticide credits awarded for today. Be sure, though, that you stay with us for the duration of the hour, because Zoom also will evaluate when you enter and when you leave the session in the state agencies that award pesticide credits want for us to make sure that you're with us for the duration of the hour to get that credit. So if you are from any state other than New Jersey, you are all set. All of your pesticide information has been captured and you're ready to go. If you're from New Jersey and you want credits for today, there's one extra uh, step for you to go through. Uh, we need you to send uh, a photo of your government ID at the beginning, timestamp, and at the end, that is the extra layer that is required only for uh, those interested in New Jersey pesticide credits. I've seen since we've been on today, a couple folks raise their hand. Uh, there's a comment in the chat right now. I will do my best as uh, the gentlemen who are with me talk about uh, the various things pathology wise we're gonna cover. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom uh, of the screen. That Q&A box allows for us to keep track of all the questions. We can answer them efficiently. If a question is not answered aloud, we can type the answers into the Q&A box. It keeps everything threaded uh, and tidy in, a, in a, a really nice manner. So please use the Q&A box uh, in order to ask your questions. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, it'll be posted uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, the UT Turfgrass YouTube channel. Uh, probably sometime early next week. If you are watching this as a recorded session, it is not eligible for pesticide credits. Pesticide credits are only for live viewings. If you are interested in GCSAA CEUs, we will cover that at the end of the session with what the golf course superintendents require. I think that covers all the logistics. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Brandon Horvath, and my colleague, Dr. David Schell from UT. How are you guys today? We're good. <clears throat> we have with us Lee Butler and Joe Roberts from uh, from NC State in Clemson. Gentlemen, how are you? So, well, all right. Great. I think what we're going to do, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Now I'm going to bring up something I saw on Twitter. I promise it's not going to be dangerous. Joe, you. Uh, you shared this yesterday. You quote tweeted uh, the UT Turfgrass account promoting today's session. And I don't know what I'm looking at. So uh, why don't you kind of take us through this? I think this will be a good jumping off point to uh, cover what's been going on with diseases in the Southeast. Oh, I'm going to well, sit back and listen. Fantastic. Well, I mean, everybody loves a good collage, right? You know, just kind of makes me happy. It kind of reminds me of looking at Bermuda grass roots. There's just a lot of stuff going on on Bermuda grassroots when I look at it. <laughs> but uh, instead of uh, going, you know, I guess left to right, top down, uh, we'll start here on the right-hand side and kind of the beginning of the season and what I had, had observed uh, early season. Uh, we had a lot of take all root rot earlier in the year. Um, you know, a lot of, of outbreaks that we observed. Uh, you know, a lot of our work uh, kind of spans Eastern South Carolina all the way into the Myrtle Beach area. 
And um, one of the things that I've consistently observed with take all kind of down here in this uh, bottom right hand corner would be a you know, characteristic of, of take all root rot. Uh, if you look just above that picture of take all root rot, we do see a, a, a common correlation with root knot nematode. So that's a, a gall from a, a root knot nematode. And we're actually trying to initiate some research to understand the link between these two different pathos, pathogens. Um, thinking about you know, other things that we observed this year, uh, if you, you know, look to the, the left of that, that root knot gall, we you know, do see a fair bit of lance nematode uh, issues, um, still trying to get to the bottom of, of you know, what lance are doing and, and looking for effective control measures. Uh, and then, you know, kind of below Lance, uh, you know, that, that picture of Lance nematode is a, a Pythium OOS4, um, you know, been a, a great year for us from a Pythium root rot standpoint in, in trial work. And, you know, I've diagnosed a few samples of, of Pythium root rot uh, actual, you know, locations. And then moving, you know, to the left of that, that Pythium OS4, uh, sting nematode, definitely still consistently a big issue uh, in a lot of the samples that we do. And, and just to kind of give you a sense of, of samples that we look at, I'm sure that, uh, you know, Lee Butler does a lot of disease diagnostics and we've done a little bit of disease, but I was actually just tallying up some samples that I had run from the last month and a half, and uh, I was looking at probably about 90% nematode diagnostics as opposed to 10% disease. So um, just to give you a sense of, of what we see as far as nematode issues, and still, you know, a lot of links between nematode damage and diseases flaring up, and that kind of gets to the top left, uh, where we have some, some uh, characteristic mini ring, uh, or rhizoctonia zea. And mini ring is a, a very elusive disease. I've, I've uh, you know, come to understand a little bit more or, or actually realize how much I don't understand about mini ring uh, in my couple of years back here in the Southeast. Uh, and you know, here in the PD region of South Carolina, we have, uh, we've had two out, you know, kind of a, a dual epidemic season over the last couple of years. We'll get a flush of mini ring in the spring and it'll, as the Bermuda grass really starts to fill in, it'll kind of, you know, taper off and then we'll get another epidemic kind of starting about right now. Uh, in some cases, those epidemics have stayed consistent. Uh, and in some cases, we, you know, you see responses to certain fertility practices. We see responses of certain fungicides, but um, a lot of times it, it can be quite elusive. And then on the bottom left hand is a, uh, a, a newer disease that we've observed here on station. This is actually ink spot a word I'm classifying as ink spot caused by curvularia. Uh, and uh, this is a disease that was characterized by uh, Maria Tomaso-Peterson and, um, and Philip Vines a few years ago, but we've had a considerable outbreak of this uh, on one of our research screens here. And I've actually gotten some really good data to understand some products that may work to, um, to alleviate the issue. Uh, and I have received a, a couple of calls regarding this issue as well this year. So Again, uh, this is only a snapshot of some of the things that we've observed, and I just figured that it would be a good conversation starter, which, you know, thanks for chiming in here, Jim, and uh, alluding to, you know, all the things that we've had going on. And I'm sure that Brandon and, and Lee can add to this list, so. So we already, and, have, a, we already have a question. You know, I was just going to gonna say, we've already got a question about uh, a black uh, fungus that looking the black stain on uh, Bermuda grass, any comment? And if we were guessing on, on black looking fungus on Bermuda grass, I, it would be a pretty safe guess to guess uh, curvularia, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty characteristic, you know, symptom that we see. Um, and if I actually, can you stop sharing for a second? So I've had it. So, and while you're pulling that up, Joe, I just have to go on record as saying that I prefer um, dog footprint. Uh, dog footprint, yes. Spot as a <laughs> common name, but that's just me. So this is as the outbreak has persisted, and you can see we've got some really good control measures that have really alleviated, you know, that symptomology, and you know, this border area being our, our check area, and you can kind of see it going into an actual check plot. Um, but again, you know, this is actually, you know, really thinning out, you know, turf in some areas as it's moved through. 
um, and 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 definitely something that we could associate with with that particular issue. So. What are the what are the things that are working uh, in terms of of fungicides? Like what classes? So we you know um, you know, chlorothalonil. Uh, fungicides, so you know, products that contain chlorothalonil have been pretty successful, and that would be these these first two treatments here in this particular trial. We've also looked at some of the the newer DMIs. Those are, um, I think, they're actually a little bit quicker in terms of the knockdown and in terms of this this particular trial because this was a curative trial. So um, you know, we've had some good results there. Even uh, like Ballista, you know, SDHI, you know, did show some reduction as well. Might might not be quite as quick in terms of knockdown, but uh, pretty much in this trial, everything that we looked at controlled, you know, the issue compared to the check. So um, that that's nice in that we have a lot of answers in terms of potential control strategies. Um, you know, a lot of solutions there, and you know. We have a, a lot of questions as to how you know it's really localized in this particular area. This is actually on um, Champion uh, Bermuda grass, and this is the only Champion that we have on station. But if you can kind of see here in this line, uh, this is actually Tiff Eagle, and it is on the Tiff Eagle portion of this green. It's just not as quite as severe as we're seeing it on on the Champion. So. You know, just just kind of one interesting you know tidbit in terms of what we're observing, but um, you know, still very severe. <laughs> so. Lee, have you seen this in the diagnostic clinic in North Carolina? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we I have, um, and and have seen it for for quite a few years. Um, I haven't seen a lot this year. Uh, when when I show the stats from our lab, this hasn't been very common, but it does occur. Uh, actually. We did have a very unique case of this on centipede grass uh, in a home lawn. Uh, this area received like somewhere around 16 inches of rain over a several day period. And um, their, their lawn just got absolutely blasted with, a, I don't know exactly which species of curvilinear it was. I didn't take it to that level, uh, but it caused some serious damage so much that, um, that uh, you know, they were accusing the lawn care company of, of killing their yard with something they sprayed and it was not, it was just, you know, you go back to the old disease triangle. Uh, the environment was heavily tilted in favor of that uh, and it did quite a bit of damage fast. And we've, you know, I, I think that's been a kicker for us to actually observe this this year. Occasionally we'll see it, you know, in random areas of our facility. Um, you know, it, it, it's not really as severe, but we've had some very, timely rain events over the month of July and August uh, that have really driven a lot of disease issues, uh, even outside of this. But I think that that's definitely something to note. Um, you know, one question that I might have for, for Brandon and Lee kind of on this subject is, is we see, you know, standard leaf spot symptoms a lot here, and we see a lot of curvularia uh, and not so much bifolaris uh, associated with that. And I just didn't know if you guys had any, any comment on things that you observe at your locations. And, you know, typically, you know, curvularia can be kind of, uh, you know, coming in after the fact. And what we're seeing is it does look like it's beginning to be more of a, a bona fide pathogen in certain cases. So. Yeah, I, I would say that that's exactly what I see. Um, there's a question that came in about do you find curvilary symptoms uh, more severe on Bermuda than uh, zoysia? Uh, I've certainly seen it on zoysia. It, my experience has been that on zoysia, it's not as severe. Um, maybe that's because of how, you know, lignified the, the leaves are and that it's a little more durable and able to stand up to the degradation of the fungus. Uh, but I've, I've certainly seen more severe symptoms and outbreaks on Bermuda than zoysia. I've seen it on zoysia, but it's, it just typically doesn't, uh, doesn't explode. I will say, however, on some of our uh, fine textured zoysias that we're looking at with greens type work, um, that curvularia has been an issue on some of those grasses, and there seems to be some, some genetic variability as well. So we've seen some varieties seem to be more susceptible than others, which is kind of interesting, Joe, about the stuff that you've seen with how severe it is on, on champion versus uh, eagle, uh, that there could be some, some maybe potential genetic differences. You know, and at the end of the day, like those kinds of things are important when you're selecting the grass, but uh, they don't matter much once you already have it on the ground because, you know, that you're kind of stuck 
dealing with what you've got on the ground. So um, that's certainly uh, an interesting thing. I've, I've definitely seen curvularia be more of a, you know, whatever you want to call it, a, a pathogen, uh, you know, versus a, what, what's your term, Lee, buzzard? Uh, you know, yep, the, lawns, the, lawns and buzzards. Yeah. <laughs> That the that the, that the uh, buzzards are circling, you know, we certainly see that on some grasses with curvularia, but with with Bermuda grasses and the warm season grasses, it tends to be more of a uh, a pathogen. You see it causing some damage, and 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 it probably warrants control. And it just illustrates, I mean, like like Lee said about the disease triangle thing, you know, I I lead off almost every presentation that I give with the disease triangle, just to illustrate you know, more than, more than anything and understanding that you're dealing with this balance of the host, the environment and the pathogen. And that when that balance shifts in favor of the pathogen, uh, be it a more virulent pathogen or a, a really suitable environment, you're just tilting the table in favor of it. And these grasses generally display diseases when they're at their weakest point. And so for the warm season grasses, it's when they're slowing down in the fall and, and approaching dormancy. And in the spring, when they're starting to get kind of revved up and temperatures aren't quite suitable for rapid growth, that's when we see the problems. And the opposite's true with the warm, with the cool season grasses. We see their problems when growth is slowed and, and the plant is struggling to, to do well in the hot, humid environment of the Southeast. And it's just not surprising to see that's when all the problems happen, right? Brandon, so, I thought it was interesting when we, on the putting green, the Zoysia grass putting green, hi everyone. Um, the, the Trinity, which isn't, isn't a grass we'd really recommend for putting green height versus the Primo Prism and laser, you know, that susceptible or more vulnerable host when we're mowing it down to uh, a, a quarter of an inch or 1.125 inches, an eighth of an inch. Um, that's it. The curvular really showed up on on that one more than the other varieties, and I guess it's more of a vulnerable or susceptible host. Is that, is it yeah. because of that added stress? Well, and, and we certainly saw that with with large patch as well. Like mm -hmm. I mean, down on the uh, on our our fairway uh, plot of of the Trinity, it just gets absolutely destroyed with large patch. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's pretty bad. It's a beautiful vehicle to get more poa infestation, though. But that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> we well, one thing I, I do want to gather, <laughs> one thing I do want to mention, particularly about this uh, leaf spot here with this curvularia, is this has been present since June. So it started before we would typically start to grow out of, you know, those, those symptoms uh, in July and August when Bermuda is really thriving. Um, and, you know, we've seen that with some of our disease issues here. And again, um, you know, this, this is also a little bit different than your, your standard curvularia. This doesn't produce any spores, um, which is, a, you know, one of the ways that we, you know, makes diagnosing curvularia pretty easy. Um, you know, this one is a little bit different disease, but, you know, just keep in mind, we are still showing a lot of different effective control measures with it. But it is a little bit different than your, you know, standard curvularia that you might relate to, um, like curvularia lunata or, or others that may be occurring on a lot of different Bermuda grasses and a lot of different zoysia grasses as well. So. And what's the species name on this one? That's Molina. Curvularia Molina, Molina is the. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. And we haven't, we're, we're actually going through, this hasn't been documented in, in the Carolinas, so we're going to try to go through and, and get our IDs done and, and do COVID postulates for this particular issue, because, um, but we did all of our, our work to date, it, it does line up with, with that particular issue, and um, again, if we weren't seeing any curvilaria spores, but once it grew out on plates, it, it's pretty consistent, so. Kind of in that vein, Joe, of, you know, disease damage or scars hanging around for a long time. I know in, in my extension travels, superintendents that have dealt with either mini ring or take all on, on ultra dwarf greens, you know, we're, my impression is we're kind of coming into the season, like Brandon was alluding to, where this is going to become a little bit more um, of a situation where some actions needed if it is, it hasn't been needed already. Um, can you all comment on just kind of management of those two 
those two particular pathogens on the ultra dwarfs as we move into the fall here? So I guess first one you had mentioned would be mini ring. And then the other, you know, I guess a, a lot of disease issues that, you know, are going to start to linger at this time of year. And mini ring is, is one of those that's definitely popping back up. Um, again, in some cases, it's been consistent. Uh, you know, we, you know, in terms of, of products, we, we've seen some good results out of the, the DMI QOI combo products with, uh, with mini ring. Uh, and then, you know, nutrient uh, deficiencies have been a big issue. Uh, you know, we have one area here actually that I've, I've tried to transplant a, a good portion of mini ring and I was a little bit worried last year where we, we did this transfer, um, albeit this year I've been a bit concerned with being able to get a hold of the mini ring because it's just been so bad. Uh, but one of the things that I've noticed in this particular area in mini ring being uh, linked to some nutrient deficiencies is we have a very high infestation of sting nematode. So, you know, you, you've got these individual stressors that are coming together and, and wreaking havoc on, on turf grass roots, and then you're starting to see foliar symptoms. So, you know, make sure you're looking at the whole picture uh, because we are getting into the time of year where you start to need to consider, um, you know, sting nematode coming back up in the soil profile and, and effective control measures for that. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, always look at all of those options when trying to, you know, even address a particular disease issue because we are seeing some links with, with those two issues. I'll let Brandon and Lee chime in on, on their two cents too. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the, the big things that I see in areas where, where mini ring is, is a particular issue, and I've seen it uh, last year, I saw it on just, uh, you know, Bermuda grass fairways, not even like, not just greens. So we, in Knoxville, we have, we're probably still 70% bent grass, 30% Bermuda grass uh, ballpark estimate. Um, and, and we saw on some fairways uh, areas of mini ring damage uh, last fall. And in every instance, whether it's on Bermuda grass greens or, uh, or uh, Bermuda grass fairways, uh, we were you, a lot of ammonium sulfate use, not a lot of ure, urea use. Uh, some of the, the, the guys that are, are uh, managing Bermuda grass greens have switched over mostly for that reason to try to make uh, their control of mini ring a little bit better. And they're seeing some, some impact of doing that, making sure that they're using a non-ammonium sulfate you know, based fertility program. Um, they're still seeing some, like we have a trial out at one of our local golf courses right now that has just a couple of localized dense areas of disease. Um, and all of those are in areas that have been recently or previously stressed. And it wouldn't surprise me if we started looking and doing some digging and we might actually do that in some of the, you know, surrounding trial areas, looking at nematode counts and things like that to see is that an area, because it's the localized area, which is also typically, I mean, I think it'd be worthwhile to comment a little bit more as we, as we talk today about some of the interactions that we're seeing with nematode activity and, and disease, because I think that's a, a critical link in our understanding of some of these things that are, you know, we're, I, I would say like kind of, if you look at the, the trajectory of disease control, whether it's warm season or cool season grasses, we're, we're past the point of dealing with the easy to control diseases, right? Like we're not spending a lot of time on how do we control dollar spot or brown patch or what have you. It's the, the things that are still the head scratchers and are tough to control are these root pathogens that cause damage and, and aren't necessarily linked to some re just real straightforward environmental cue. It's, it's a combination of things that are happening from a cultural perspective that then the plant is made more susceptible and then we see uh, symptoms show up. And in a lot of cases, it's not just one organism that's causing that, that type of uh, issue. It's, it's the combination of, of a nematode feeding then that root is leaking and then that leads to some pathogen coming in and taking advantage of that. And then the plant is then stressed. And if you get enough of those things piling on top of one another, you start to see symptoms, right? Oh, 
Come on, Lee, you're quiet. What? Uh, I, I thought Brandon was still uh, educating us. He's just he's just <laughs> giving us bad shake. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was yeah. just taking a deep breath. <laughs> no, I um I do have a couple things I'd like to add. Um, and, and more from a control standpoint, uh, you know, because we've we've played with this thing for a few years now, and it's it's been all over the board, right? Um, until last year, and I'll come back to that. But until last year, really, you know, urea was the king on really managing mini ring, right? Um, we've looked at all the different fungicides. We've had mixed results. QOI and DMI uh, products do tend to do better uh, based on our research. So stuff like Briskway, Headway. Uh, we, we've even had uh, trials where rotations of Ballista and Dacanil Action look good. Um, I've seen Tebiconazole do good, but uh, you know Tebiconazole scares the. <laughs> I, I just do not like it on ultra doors. Um, I've just seen too many bad things on the backside of it, regardless of the time of year. Uh, but I have seen Tebiconazole check it up. Um, but but you know the fertility thing is obviously the biggest. Uh, when Luke and uh, they did that work at Clemson, uh, you know one of the courses we were working with, kind of a mom and pop, if you will, in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, one, some of the oldest champion in our state, actually, uh, they had really, really severe mini ring, uh, and we switched them over to urea as their nitrogen source and, and pretty much did away with it. Um, so uh, th that was interesting to see in itself. Um, uh, back to the fungicide thing, you know, something else that Luke uh, Dant did when he was at Clemson uh, was how deep uh, that, that organism is, right? It's not, it's not on the foliage. You know, he was seeing it down on stolen rhizomes roots. Uh, and, and I agree with that. When I, when I diagnose mini ring samples, that's the first place I go to <clears throat> as I go down uh, below the soil surface and start looking for the organism there. And that's often where I find it. Uh, often find it uh, where the nodes are uh, down there. Uh, it's very easy to find in those little pockets. Uh, and with that being said, something that, that's changed is, um, is getting the fungicide on target. So I think early on, people may have just been making foliar sprays and not reaching uh, the, the Rhizoctonia zea, if you will. Uh, so now we lightly water in our treatments uh, to reach that zone, uh, and that, that has helped. <clears throat> uh, the one last thing I will say, and this is going back to the until last year, uh, there is a, a newer fungicide that's coming out from Bayer. Uh, it's going to be called Densacore, if you haven't heard about it yet. Uh, it, it, you know, we had a trial with it last year in a heavily infested uh, mini ring um, green, uh, and it was lights out, right? Um, it was flawless, did really, really good. It's probably, probably the, the, the most shocking fungicide treatment I've seen uh, on, the, on that pathogen uh, in, in, in all the trials we've ever done. Uh, we, as with anything, we need to repeat it, and we're doing that right now. Uh, so that's kind of a st stay tuned thing, but there is some... some some hope on the horizon, you will, to have another tool in your box to, to manage that. So I'm going to ask a, a question here. You know, I, we have a lot of lawn care folks that, that join us for these sessions. And I think one of the things they may be wondering right now is this urea ammonium sulfate relationship, is that specific to mini ring and golf greens? Or would that be something that regardless of what turf you're managing, moving to urea-based nitrogens might maybe would help you on the disease front rather than ammonium sulfate. That's a good question. Um, I mean, there's it, only a it, handful it, it, of diseases that, that you typically think of nitrogen source being a, a particular issue. Um, but, uh, Generally speaking, I think urea, you know, urea would, would probably be a good choice across the board. I don't, there's not very many that you think of that they're the other way where urea makes things worse, um, but there's only a handful of diseases. So I don't know that it's a major issue on the lawn care front. Lee, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I was just going to say it varies, right? I don't think it's a clear cut answer, but um... You know, it, it, I don't, you know, we, in fescue, you know, we did all the work with uh, nitrogen, uh, looking at brown patch and, and uh, for the past several years that we've done it, we only looked at urea exclusively. Now we're looking at different sources now, actually in conjunction with uh, Kale Bigelow at Purdue and, and uh, Jada, his graduate student, but um, back to the urea thing, you know, 
it, it definitely did not make brown patch more severe. So it kind of makes me wonder, um, you know, are we seeing a similar thing like we do with the mini ring? Um, a lot of it has to do with growing out of the damage, right? If, if when, Once you're hit by any disease, if you're not feeding the plant, it's just sitting there begging for food, you're going to be looking at those symptoms uh, for a long time because the, the plant has to grow to, to, to recover and, and replace that damaged tissue with, with um, healthy tissue. So um, I, don't, I don't think it's a straightforward across the board in all turf. It, it kind of very, depends on which disease you're talking about in the host. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think too, like building off that brown patch work, I mean, that's the same thing we saw with the work that Matt Kelly did uh, when I was transitioning from tech to here. Uh, you know, it was the same, same kind of thing. We saw that the fertility increases didn't result in increased disease uh, damage. You might have seen a slightly higher incidence of disease that that it, it occurs a little more frequently, but every time you get a recovery period where there was weather suitable for the plant to grow and it had food to grow, it recovered out of those symptoms and it diminished the, the appearance of symptoms. And I think that's one of the big issues with you know, the brown patch recommendations that we often make in lawn care in the Southeast of you, you see the, the don't fertilize going into the summer and then you have a plant that's nitrogen starved and you get a brown patch that starts this big and then it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. Whereas if you, even if you had more incidents uh, with a higher fertility, like the plant's a little more succulent, it's a little more susceptible, but every time you get the recovery, you get a patch and then it goes away and then you get a patch and it goes away. That's far better from an appearance standpoint than, and then if you're making a fungicide application, which many of our tall fescue uh, lawn care operators, you know, managing tall fescue lawns are, are making, you know, a fungicide application, then that just makes it, makes the control that much more effective. I mean, that's been my experience for sure. And you're, you're seeing the same thing with the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, I believe Brandon back in the spring when we were talking about tall fescue uh, lawn management in an earlier Turf Tuesday session, you shared that, uh, you know, we uh, at our research farm had bulk spread fertilizer for the first time ever uh, to have slow release nitrogen for the duration of the summer. And uh, you didn't have as much air, as large of an area of brown patch to do research on because we, we <laughs> really struggled with with brown patch in that area. And this year we flagged it off. And David, do you care to comment on how much disease we've got down there? We have a lot. <laughs> we have a lot challenging the paradigm that summer fertility causes more brown patch that uh 100 percent uh we had a question uh come in on back on mini ring um lee you, you talked about the new product from bear um and whether or not the question is whether that will be u.s registration only or if it will have a uk registration no clue um we, we'd have to ask the bear folks i'm not sure where they're at in that process it, it is a dmi it, it's a dmi for what it's worth um yeah. and i guess you we can group it in to what we call these safer dmis um you know you don't have the phyto risk like you do with some of the older dmis for, for what it's worth yeah if there's any bear folks I've, I've just briefly scanned the participants list but if there's any bear folks that care to comment in in the chat that we can share if there's going to be international registrations on on Densicore, that'd be great. Um, certainly here in the U.S., it's it's a it's an excellent fungicide. So, Joe, kind of looping back to where we started, you made a comment about increases in nematode diagnostics at, in South Carolina. Lee, are you seeing the same in North Carolina with samples coming in more on the nematode front? Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, can I share my screen real quick and I can show it? Go down that line. All right. Uh, let's go up. Yeah, so I just made a few. You can see that good, I assume. Um, so just real quick, because uh, this kind of rolls into the question you're asking. Um, this is uh, just show you. Um, what our lab has seen so far this year. So this is as of yesterday. 
So this is as fresh as it gets, <laughs> but uh, just show you that, you know, we, we do get samples from all over the country, but uh, majority of them come from the Southeastern United States. Uh, what I'm going to show, I'm leaning more towards the golf stuff and you'll see why here in a second, uh, but that's just showing you where they come from. Uh, total wise, it, it's uh, last year, uh, you know, we were closed for 52 days due to COVID. Uh, so it was definitely a below average year. Uh, but when we look at this year, uh, I projected it out to the end of the year. Um, it's still going to be considered a below average year, if you will, uh, compared to years in the past, uh, but, but pretty close. Um, as far as the samples we get, I think it's important for you folks to understand, as I show a couple more slides, that 80% of what we get comes from golf course putting greens. Uh, we do get some from landscape, home lawns, residential, commercial, ornamental nurseries. So that's like ornamental grasses sod farms and sports turf. Uh, we hardly ever get any sports turf, but we do get some, all right? Um, <clears throat> sample distribution, uh, and this is looking at just golf samples, so golf course putting greens. Um, you know, it used to be that, that creeping bent grass was king, but Bermuda has long surpassed it in the past uh, two or three years in our lab. Bermuda is always number one. Uh, so Bermuda grass is, a, is probably, and we're still getting ready to hit the, the, second, the second shoulder of Bermuda grass samples, if you will. Uh, so that, that bar is going to get even larger uh, as we go with the fall into winter. Uh, so it'll probably end up being 50% or more. Then you see creeping bent grass by itself. You see annual bluegrass. So when you see that, uh, majority of that's either coming from up north or like out in California. Uh, and then you see bent poa, which is a, a mix. And a, a lot of times, you know, those always crack me up because they'll say, you know, it's bent poa, but it ends up being mostly poa. But I call it bent poa. So a lot of that's coming from the mountains of North Carolina, from up north um, is where those come from. And then we get a few uh, seashore past palum samples, but not that many, all right? Uh, and then this is my last slide. Uh, and I just went through this morning uh, and looked at the top uh, diagnoses that have been made this year on each host. And once again, this is only on golf course putting greens. Uh, so if we start with Bermuda grass, you'll see that take all root rot uh, is still number one. Uh, it has been number one for, for quite a few years now. Uh, mini ring, uh, that's up uh, several spots from, from past years. Kind of thought that almost went away, but uh, as, as Joe said earlier, we had a lot of mini ring samples in the spring, and now we're starting to get them again uh, right now. Uh, it just started showing symptoms on our champion putting green at our research farm here in Raleigh. Our um, uh, mini ring site about an hour south of here is absolutely blasted with it right now. So yeah, the symptoms are showing themselves and, uh, very active right now. Pythium root rot, um, that's one uh, that I see quite a bit on Bermuda grass. Fairy ring and then cream leaf blight. Uh, for creeping bent grass folks, Pythium root rot tends to be number one. Uh, I would say that the one that's an oddball uh, this year is summer patch. Uh, and you can see for, for bent, bent poa and poa putting green, summer patch is near the top, either number two or number one. Uh, and I would say that's odd. Uh, I've seen uh, an unusual amount of summer patch. And I think uh, Brandon has as well. We, we can talk about that later, but uh, definitely seen more of that this year than normal. Um, Pythium root dysfunction kind of comes and goes, but this is showing itself this year for whatever reason, fairy ring and thracnose. And then you see bent poa, uh, which tends to be mostly poa, right? And thracnose, summer patch, no surprises there. Those tend to be at the top for those. Brown ring patch. Talk about brown ring patch, we're probably talking like out west, California, out, out that way, uh, take all patch. And then in the POA, right, seashore past palum. But the one thing you see that's not that much up there are, are nematodes. So one thing that's different about our lab from, from Joe's lab is we don't uh, count nematodes. Uh, the only nematode that I'll ever document typically is root knot nematode uh, because the females are so easy to see. Uh, and if, if the sample's just overwhelmed with it, you know, I'll, I'll call it a problem without having a proper count. Uh, but we don't, we're not set up to count for nematodes. So we focus, you know, just on uh, fungi, bacteria, um, and things like that. So um, definitely do see a lot of samples where it's obvious the root system has been just hammered uh, with, with nematode activity. And often just, you know, refer those clients to, um, to send samples off to a nematode lab uh, to, to have the, a proper assay done. Uh, to do that. Uh, the last thing I will say, which is always interesting, is if you'll see at the bottom here uh, of the golf course putting green samples uh, this year so far, 38% of those, uh, no pathogen found, right? Uh, there are a lot of things that cause that, but, but you do have to remember there are a lot of things that kill turf or cause turf to look uh, not, not right. 
uh, don't always assume it's a pathogen or an insect or whatever. Um, and so, you know, of that 38%, I, I, I genuinely believe a lot of it is it, it has nothing to do with the disease. Um, a, a big reason I believe that is uh, in our lab now, we require photos. Uh, so, you know, between looking at photos and seeing the symptoms and what I see or don't see under the microscope, uh, I think that has increased our accuracy significantly uh, in our lab, but still quite a bit, you know, uh, you know, four out of 10 samples have nothing to do with the disease at all. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over. Yeah, and then I'll, I'd like to chime in really quick on one of the things that you just said, Lee. Sorry to interrupt you, Brandon. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, one of the things that Lee had mentioned, and this has been something that I've kind of uh, noticed as a trend this year, just because we we do get, uh, you know, so many opportunities to look at nematode populations. I thought it was really good that you had noted that you're really diagnosing root knot nematode based off of the presence of the females. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed probably more so this year, and I think it's just because we've been doing, you know, more samples in that realm, is that utilizing some of the newer, you know, missed methods with um, Dr. Crow's work, we're actually seeing significant root knot nematode populations in the absence of significant uh, females observed on the root. So, um, you know, if you are seeing, you know, symptoms that are uncharacteristic in, you know, just areas of decline, um, you know, I definitely would, would, you know, follow up with Lee's comments on, you know, looking at or sending a sample to a designated nematode lab, uh, because it is possible that, you know, you do have these, um, these populations that are persistent that, you know, you may not be seeing that, that characteristic galling. Um, you know, that we associate with the females. Can, can you comment on the, the misting? Uh, and then like, do you guys do that? Does your lab do that? Yeah, work? so, yeah, so we, we offer uh, mist samples and then also, um, you know, on campus, they do that too. A lot of our stuff is more so diagnostic for our research plots um, that we have, but, you know, misting as opposed to, to soil extraction. So, you know, uh, if you send a sample into our lab and just ask for a nematode analysis, uh, that's typically going to be extracted with what we call a, a sugar flotation method. Uh, and essentially, you know, we'll utilize, uh, like kind of, uh, same cores as you would take with a soil sample, you know, for a nutrient analysis, we, you know, suggest, you know, several cores from an area that you, um, whether it's, you know, diagnostic or routine sampling, but, um, you know, we'll mix those, those cores up in a, in a water solution. And we have a, a series of, of steps where we, you know, float the, uh, the nematodes in that soil solution out and are able to, to count those based off of a certain threshold that we have established. Now, what that is missing is it's solely looking at nematodes that are in soil solution and would be, what would be feeding on the outside of the roots. Now, contrast that with parasites, right? ectoparasitic nematodes. Now, if you contrast that, or you know, thinking about the nematodes that would be in question there would be sting nematodes, spiral nematode, ring nematode, stubby root, um, could be root not nematode, but you know, if they're in soil solution, uh, but if we're thinking about, you know, other aspects of, of nematode damage, particularly with root knot nematode and lance nematode, these are what we consider endoparasitic nematodes, and they will actually burrow into the roots. And that's where you need a mist extraction. And essentially what that utilizes, we, we use the, the same methodology that was established by Dr. Crow at University of Florida. Uh, we use one and a half inch uh, cores, uh, similar to a zoysia plugger. Uh, and we, we wash those roots out and we miss them uh, in a chamber uh, for three days, 72 hours. And what that does is it actually causes the, um, the juveniles to, to move out of the root, uh, those eggs, it gives the, the time for the eggs that are in that to hatch. And then you're able to enumerate, you know, what would be internal uh, and, and again, could be causing, you know, significant damage that might not be captured with a standard, you know, soil asset. And is that so the with the the mist? Are you also picking up lance, or is that just root knot? No, no, we definitely pick up more lance with with mist samples. Um, you know, it, it, lance is um, you know kind of elusive. It can be you know both um, in terms of what we've seen. 
uh, it's definitely more accurate in terms of capturing root knot juveniles, uh, you know, is where we see the advantage there. And that's, if you look at, at Dr. Crow's work, I mean, that's really specific to Bermuda grass. Uh, they didn't really find much of a difference with big grass samples um, when they were comparing mist versus uh, standard, you know, soil extraction. Uh, it, but Bermuda grass in particular, you know, the, the difference is astounding, you know, in terms of what you're able to capture with uh, root knot juveniles as opposed to, or in, in soil versus the mist method. So, so, if you were, you know, you could just write up a, a, a plan for a, a, a superintendent that was looking at, uh, you know, just understanding what's going on from a nematode perspective. I assume sampling would be fall and spring. Is that kind of, you know, basically when the plant starts growing and when it starts slowing down, whether it's, you know, even the cool season grasses, you're going to, you're going to, look in the spring, right? When roots are- Yeah, I mean, what, yeah, but the one thing that's really interesting, and a lot of that kind of, you know, relates to some work that, that Glenn Golly did at, um, at NC State, looking at, you know, nematodes moving within the profile. Um, this year, we've seen staying samples consistent, you know, throughout the season, you know, in, in areas where we would think they would generally be moving a lot deeper in the profile when it, we get into that heat of the summer. So I do think that, you know, that can be location specific, um, but that's a good start, what you're saying, you know, and, and thinking about just kind of general routine sampling, you know, right. at some various times of the year. It's not like, you know, we, we can send in, you know, samples every month for, for all greens. It's, that would be <laughs> a bit much. So. Right. And well, and then, and then the, that's one of the things that I struggle with, with, talking with superintendents about, well, okay, so how do I know if I have a problem, right? Like you, you may have, you know, you may have something that's contributing to some, some areas of turf that just don't look quite healthy or you always struggle with or what have you. Um, and, and then you've got the two different methods, right? So you've got the flotation method and the mist method. Um, so then I would assume you take two separate samples for those, right? Because the, the, the flotation method, you, you're really probably better off with smaller individual cores bulked together over the area that you're interested in looking at. And you probably want to look primarily at areas that tend to struggle in a localized fashion with a number of samples. And then an area that maybe is in good shape that you look at those and bulk those two separately, right? You don't want to, you know, decrease your numbers by looking at healthy turf and unhealthy turf in one bulk sample. Would yeah, you'll be, be diluting it out. Right. And then, um, and then, and then if you were going to do the mist sample method, even in that same area, I would assume you would want to take a separate sample of those, right? Yep. And, yeah, and, so typically and, we'll get, we'll actually get samples in, um, you know, from uh, more of our local areas where we'll get, you know, a standard soil sample bag with, with, you know, 10, 15 cores, um, or, you know, a half inch core like we would do for a nutrient analysis. And then we will actually get separate samples in. Sometimes they're actually taken with a zoysia plugger. Sometimes they'll send in a couple of, of actual four inch, you know, cup cutter plugs that we will individually cut out our, you know, areas that we need. And again, that's just all based off of work from University of Florida and usually utilizing their same thresholds. And if you were going to do the, the, the misting uh, method, how many, how many plugs or how many cores would you want to see from an area that you suspect root knot activity? We base that off of four cores. So four inch and a half diameter cores is what we, okay. what our numbers are based off of. So um, again, it, you know, I know you had mentioned, you know, kind of more of a diagnostic type sampling, you know, if you have areas of dead turf, don't take a nematode sample from a dead area. You're not going to see any nematodes. They do move in soil solution and they'll move into the areas of, of where that turf is actively declining or even in, you know, uh, more of a healthy area. So that's where we typically recommend. So if you have a, a you know, a general area of declining turf, utilize the outer portion of that. Same with diseases. We always want to take from that border area to where we can get that most actively growing pest um, 
So we, we all often recommend the same thing with nematodes. Um, and if you could pull a few, you know, zoysia plugs or, or send in a couple of cup cutter plugs from that border region, that's how we would do the, the mist analysis as well. Yeah. And, and, and I had a student uh, about a year and a half ago do an independent study with me and I had him basically dive into the literature on nematodes and write a report. He was a graduating senior and the the getting ready to be become an assistant superintendent down in uh, Arizona and his uh, assessment in his report was that we don't have a real good handle on the biology of nematodes. Um, you do a lot of work, Joe. Would you like? I, I mean, I think there's a lot of good literature on what they are and how to identify them and that kind of thing. But I think when you get into the biology and and being able to talk to a superintendent or a turf manager about what the impact of these things are on their on the quality of their turf, I think it seems to be a, somewhat of a black box right now. I completely agree. And, and Brandon, I've known you for a long time, and Lee as well. And, and you probably know that that nematology has only been in my position description for two years. Um, so, <laughs> so we, you know, we've obviously been doing a lot of work in this area and we have a lot of work planned, but, you know, just in, in general understanding, I think, um, you know, work at a University of Florida has really shown a lot in terms of understanding endoparasitic populations versus ectoparasitic, but there's still just a lot of questions. Um, and, and again, you know, I've talked to, to Lee and Jim about this a lot, just seeing these relationships with, with these pathogen complexes and stuff. And really, we just have a lot of questions more so than answers at this point. So. Yeah, for sure. It's something that is interesting to me. And, and Lee, do you, do you, uh, you want to venture a guess? You talked about the summer patch thing. We should probably revisit that as our time is kind of starting to dwindle. Um, is there, is there any, any indication that the, that the uh, nematodes could be playing a role with that? with that pathogen being somewhat of an odd bird in the bent grass world? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I don't have any solid uh, evidence, yeah, but either. being a soil borne pathogen attacking the roots, I mean, they go hand in hand, man. They're, you know, they're in there dancing together. So uh, definitely a thing. I mean, you know, I, I was getting the summer pack samples from all over here in this area out West. Um, it seemed to me that uh, it, it was more uh, areas that would go that uh, would go through very very hot dry spells. That's what would call symptom expression, uh, which would make sense for a, a root disease. Um, but I mean that's always been the issue with with summer patch. Or I mean I've got it right back here on on bluegrass. <laughs> um, you know it's all, it's always been the issue is you know it, it's you know up in the Midwest you you see this this disease show up symptomatically when turf goes under some sort of moisture stress and then you see the wilting of the plant. And that was one of the things that led to a lot of the recommendations for home lawns, like uh, Dr. Brosnan was talking, we, we have a lot of home lawn folks uh, on, on our calls here. You know, that, that's, a, that's a classic reason for why a, a more light frequent irrigation strategy seems to diminish some of those issues. It's not that you get rid of the pathogen, you just never let the, the plant come under the moisture stress that revealed the presence of the pathogen, right? And, and, and you see that, it's not surprising that we see the same thing in, in, a, in a shorter cut turf as well. So I have a question really quick, Joe, before you, you jump into this, just from a place of learning, is the same true with Pythium root rot that you'll see it in when there's more stressful uh, situations that you've alluded to there, Brandon? You know, because I looked at your slide, Lee, that I think it was number three on bent grass and number one, or excuse me, number three on Bermuda grass and number one on bent grass. I mean, that's kind of an equation for number one in the power rankings. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, is it the same sort of situation that has been described with some of these other root diseases? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, didn't Billy do the work at Florida with that, Brandon and Joe? showing or one of his students did the work showing the um, association with nematode feeding and, and other spe you know there, there are a lot of different species of pythium and that, that kind of complicates things but definitely um, I, I feel like I definitely do see that uh, in the samples that I look at 
Now, now, sometimes there are plenty of times where there are probably no nematodes present and it's just good old fashioned bona fide pythium root rot doing its thing on its own. Uh, but it, it, these things are far more complex than, as, as Brandon just said, there, there's a lot more that we don't know than we do know. I mean, anyone that's ever looked at a turf sample under a microscope, it, it's another universe. It's like looking into outer space with a, with a telescope, right? It's, it's just so much going on down there. Um, you know, I, I, there's no way that we fully understand exactly what's going on. Absolutely. And that was always one of the things that with, back when the uh, diagnostic workshop that Alan Wyndham would put on at the GIS that we, uh, you know, a number of us would help out with. That was always one of the take homes that the, that the folks taking the workshop always had was when they actually looked at some of the turf samples. They're like, you guys have to wade through all of these other things that are moving around and swimming around, like, and figure out what, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not as easy as just taking a quick look. I mean, you know, Joe, I think one of the, one of the other keys with what you mentioned about the nematode, the misting sample, 72 hours, right? Like if you send a sample off and you think you're going to get something back that's, that's highly accurate in, in two or three or five or 10 or 24 hours, you're kind of kidding yourself, right? Like the, the, the thing that I think is amazing is, is, yeah, that's great to get a quick answer, but generally speaking, all of the folks on these calls are, are in, in, in the audiences that we talk to, they're, they're pretty talented at knowing, you know, dollar spot and brown patch, the stuff that you end up sending a sample, if you're scratching your head and then you send us a four and a quarter inch sample of it, we're going to scratch our heads for a little bit too. And we're going to try to figure out what's going on and it's going to be not so easy. And four out of 10, as Lee talked about, you're going to come back with, you know, we just don't see anything. And, and it, it, it's, it's not as simple as, as just looking at it and going, oh, yep, there it is. And sometimes it is, but it's just not that often that that happens. That's why Lee has a job, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? It takes a considerable here, amount of time, right? I was just going to chime in on the uh, the summer patch issue and stress. So this is actually a, a, a nice characteristic photo of, of summer patch damage. Um, this is from a, a golf course that I used to do some work at in Maryland. And this is a, a walkway from the tee box to the fairway. And just goes to show you mowing height and, uh, and summer patch damage. This is actually taken in June. Um, very early season when we would typically see summer patch issues. And I can tell you later in the year, we would always get very good summer patch in here, but that mowing factor earlier in the year, it just exacerbated that stress and, and really brought on that symptomology early. So just wanted to, to chime in with that, that stress uh, factor on, on summer patch. Yeah, grow healthy grass. That's your number one fungicide. Well, I'm going to click over to our GCSAA um, certification code for those who are watching and need this. This is not for pesticide credits. This is if you are a golf course superintendent and you need to register participation in today's session for CEUs. This is your event approval code. If you are watching this as a recording, uh, you want to make sure that you list the actual event date, September 14th, 2021, and not uh, the day that you're watching the recording. Um, last question for me before we wrap here, it's for you, Lee. So you said 40% of your samples were no disease. I'd be curious to know how many of that 40% did somebody send you something that was army worm damage that they thought was disease? So um, I do get a few of those and they tend to be uh, photos and I'll just shuffle them right off to the entomology people. Uh, but there have definitely been a lot of that. On a funner note, I, I think folks will get a kick out of this. Our poor um, uh, Dr. Matt Bertone, who runs the, the, the insect or the plant disease and insect clinic, and he's the entomologist. Ever since, uh, I feel like it was last year when the, when the murder hornet story hit, he has been completely flooded and overwhelmed with people killing cicada killers, uh, European hornets, bumblebees. Yeah, I mean, anything that even comes close to looking like a murder hornet, uh, the, poor, the poor man has just been overwhelmed with that. Um, and just like when it first was documented in the Pacific Northwest, I think it was Oregon or Washington, 
Uh, there have been no confirmed cases of, of murder hornets uh, here in North Carolina. Yeah. No, no mur murder hornets in Tennessee either. In fact, I think the only <laughs> murder hornets that are confirmed are in Washington State, as I, as I recall. And we're a good ways away from there. And hopefully we keep it that way, right? Well, gentlemen, I, we are at 1231. Uh, our attendees have been with us for the hour to get their pesticide credit. So I'd like to thank all you for your time and participation today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us. Uh, we have one more of these sessions left in 2021. It'll be on October 5th, and it'll kind of overlap with what we talked about today, uh, focusing on kind of shoulder season issues, particularly for warm season turf. Uh, I know Brandon will talk a little bit about large patch and spring dead spot. I'm going to talk about co-annual control and kind of winter annual uh, broadleaf weed control and so forth. So join us on October 5th for that, for the last pesticide credit for the year. Gentlemen, thanks again and uh, hope everyone listening enjoys the rest of their day.